fund their own projects, I cannot imagine there will be support to finance another neighbor's project. Thank you for your time and on behalf of our BSI community. We look forward to your acceptance of this bid, which will allow all boaters, own, all boat owners, safe passage on the perimeter canal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Citizens' comments on regular agenda items? Okay, seeing none, we'll move into Budget A Agreement to Brants Diversified. Good morning, Marion Pace, Procurement Manager. The city opened bids for this project for the BSI perimeter dredging project. It was budgeted for an estimated cost of $530,000. Uh, it came in at $469,524. This is a new contractor bidding on uh, marine construction. We were very pleased to see their bid along with other new bidders, and they have been vetted through the reference survey process. Staff recommends award. Questions, comments? Yes. Just one quick question. Um, did we have any kind of a budgeted amount in mind before we put the bid out? 530000 Okay, so we're well under that. Good. Yes. Um, Ed, you said that this um, a vendor has been um, vetted. Yes. So we, we, um, we don't sent, expect to run into the sorry. same problem we've run in with Alligator Creek. Um, I know that's not a city project. That's a Wait. county project, but the Alligator Creek uh, dredging has been a... A nightmare <laughs> so uh, it, it, very behind schedule um, so just want to make sure that this we went through and we checked all of the um, various databases that are available to us to see if okay. they've been debarred suspended uh, including FDOT we've looked at their Better Business Bureau rating we've looked at federal ratings um, we've sent out their surveys for their references and they all came back very favorable okay great thank you there's no guarantee I understand no. well I will say in fairness to the <clears throat> to the um, vendor who's doing the alligator Creek dredging uh, where boaters have had issues that the company has been very forthright in coming forward and paying for prop damage and things like that so um, it's just take that difficult process so anything else then I'd like to move approval second we have a motion a second to approve the agreement award all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed carried unanimously <clears throat> next we have the Trey View Woods fresh market and garden <clears throat> resolution agreement and funding good morning Good morning. Um, yeah, for the record, John LeBeau, Urban Design. Uh, at the May 3rd meeting, Council did approve that the we reject the bids on the um, Tribu Fresh Market Garden and use additional funding from the city to pay for that. Uh, mm -hmm. This before you, um, this item before you has the attached resolution and agreement for this project, as well as the identification of the funds for the first $5,000 for the first year for the startup costs, as well as the next two years for the $5,000 to be used each year for operating and maintenance costs. We um, recommend approval. If, if you intend to consider the adoption of this resolution, now, which I, I think is, is the intent, uh, you'll permit me to read the resolution by title only? Yes. Thank you. This is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, approving an agreement between Tribute Tribu Woods United Association, Inc., and the City of Punta Gorda for the use of property known as 317 East Virginia Avenue, Punta Gorda, Florida, 33950, for an agripreneur garden and authorizing the city manager to execute the agreement on behalf of the city and providing an effective date. The uh, business plan that was attached to the agreement mm -hmm. is one of the better business plans that uh, we have ever received by any nonprofit group that has come before us. Mm -hmm. So whoever did it did a very nice job. Yeah. And uh, yes, it's taken, you know, a little bit of extra time, but I think we need to, you know, have all the pieces come together for this. Mm -hmm. And I just realized the online agenda item is different than what I have on my paper, so I'm sorry if <coughs> these two things were in reverse order, but I don't know which is right. So, yeah. Nancy? Um, I just have a question about the timing on all of this. I uh, realize we're going back out to bid. Um, for this but uh, we're working with procurement right now on redoing the uh, bid specs because we have to remove all of the CDBG requirements out of there um, as soon as we get it done we'll put it out okay. having been involved with a community garden projects uh, before um, knowing that the, the planting season and the 
we'll, in the fall, we'll start in September. Um, so uh, is there any way we can have something ready by that time? So we don't miss the, the fall planting season or? I believe it's just the removal. The, the, the bid is already together. So all we have to do is, is simply remove those references to the CDBG funds. I don't look for that to take a long. 21 days on the street. 21 days on the street for the bid. So. Okay. okay. We're, we're asking you to approve at least the agreement so that they sure. know here's the group that's going to manage it. Mm -hmm. And then we're working on the bid. Well, I think it was an outstanding business plan. So I think they did. Great so job. Do Question? Just a quick question. Um, do we have any anyone on city staff that will have any oversight on this project? Ur Urban Design will work with them if they need assistance, but I don't. Uh, I mean, since we are using some city funds for this, I just want to, you know. Public Works Public oversees works will the have construction. A, but the ongoing? Urban Design. Okay. All right. Okay. Then I'd like to move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the resolution agreement and funding. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, next we have renovations of the city council chambers. Marion Pace, procurement manager. First, I'd like to disclose I am black and white, and this gentleman here is colorful in the city. And so this is a very ugly drawing that I did, <laughs> <clears throat> trying to identify the space in city hall. Um, we're requesting City Council to appropriate for this fiscal year up to $28,000 uh, to renovate the, the City uh, Council Chambers. Um, our plans that we were originally want, wanting to do was to possibly remove this platform up front, but then we found out that was concrete underneath, so that's not going to happen. So the, the immediate um, temporary um, renovations would be to remove the fixed seating. We did remove three chairs, and there was very there was really no damage to the carpet where the um, screws went into so we feel that it is going to be appropriate to be able to remove these fixed chairs and replace them with chairs that are um, more comfortable and they're uh, the same ones that are used with the pgi civic association um, <clears throat> we will also be uh, painting the um, the council chambers and also the council's office and conference room We'll be removing the chair railing. Um, we're going to replace the ceiling fans and the installation of new LED lighting within the chambers. Uh, paint the aluminum grids white and replace all the ceiling tiles. Uh, re and then in the council um, office conference room, we're going to remove, there's a couple of um, uh, lateral ca filing cabinets in there that ca it's not really being used in the countertop i checked into that's not fixed so we're going to remove that back part and then also um, put in a different conference room table and chairs in that area uh, in the it um, budget they're going to be installing a hearing ass assisted hardware and software for meeting the ada considerations and replacing the podium uh, microphones and Phase two of the budget, which we do not have a construction or estimate at this time, but um, we're removing the dais from the semicircle here in the corner and placing it on the uh, flat against the back wall, uh, closing in that door with a window and moving the audio visual. Um, that'll be where they'll be recording the meetings. Um, and installing new carpeting, uh, new video and computer equipment and related electrical, which will include two large um, monitors to place over the dais. So when like Chris was presenting this morning, she's not looking over her corner to um, read the um, presentation and re um, replacing existing HVAC grills and replacing the podiums um, and positioning them in a better um, area so that Every, um, you, we can address whoever's speaking the entire council. Other uh, city hall areas, we're going to be painting in the, four, uh, the main corridor here, the ceiling grids white, uh, replacing the ceiling tile. We're going to remove the non-matching door trims and replace them with a matching trim. Uh, we're going to remove the existing um, base and replace it with a one inch by six inch flat stock to match the entry in the old city hall and um, this would be in the corridors only. We're gonna install a, a feature that is com uh, common in historical facilities for a picture wall. And um, 
We're going to strip the wax on the existing vinyl in the quarters so that we can install a vapor uh, barrier and um, use vinyl composite tile planks um, and then also transitions in the corridor. The planks, there are, um, it's, there's a couple of them manufactured specifically for commercial use, which we will be installing in the Cooper Street uh, rec uh, Recreation Facility in that project, and which has a 30-year uh, commercial, 20-year 20, 20 commercial warranty. Uh, so it'll be have a wood look. Um, we're going to reach carpet the stairs in the second floor and uh, the second floor corridor, install new LED recessed lighting in the corridors, replace the existing HVAC grills, uh, touch up and restain any of the wood um, areas in City Hall, remove the antique chairs and pews from City Hall entry. We will um, hopefully be able to relocate one of those pews in procurement, but the other antiques will be sold at auction. So. Um, publicsurplus.com and, <laughs> and paint the walls and doors including um, the city clerk's office and then also for fiscal year 2018 is to kind of refreshing up city hall annex um, again is going to be the painting of the grids replacing the tiles in the first floor lobby area uh, replace the damaged tile throughout the second and third floors. We had a few leaks during Charlie, so they're a little stained in a couple of areas. We're going to install raised looking panels on the first floor lobby and a top rail at 32 inches high and over, um, install the oversized crown molding with a base at the bottom um, that's going to join the second floor stopping at the corners and returning to the third floor landing. Uh, remove the two cabinets on the second floor, replace with wall-to-wall -wall glassed in cabinets, and remica the gray cabinet on the third floor. Um, as you're walking into City Hall Annex, you'll notice that you can see the ground floor, so they're going to put the obscure the glass so that you don't see the ground and coordinate it with the new wall panels. This will also include um, LED lighting in the corridors and install recessed art lighting on the second and third floors. Uh, we'll be painting the first floor lobby and second floor walls. Um, we're going to replace the furniture on the third floor reception area with a more appropriate um, new reception area furnishings and paint the third floor um, seating area, which uh, city managers open area and conference rooms only. Um, and as I said, any of the furnishings that we do remove, we will either be repurposing them in city facilities or um, selling them at auction. Thank you. Now, while we have, you guys probably have a lot of comments regarding phases two and three. Mm -hmm. This is the first time you're seeing all of this. Phases two and three um, is more a FY 2018 conversation. Because there's going to be a lot of conversation with everything that uh, the procurement manager just talked about. What I'd like us to concentrate on is do we want to move forward with phase one during the time you're on break? Because that is when we want to get this work done. And that is the painting of this room and the uh, council conference room, the fixing up of some of the audio equipment, which, which is in the IT budget anyways. We plan to do that anyways. And um, the removal of the chairs and putting in chairs such as in the PGI Civic Association that they can lock together probably get some more uh, seating out here. We're looking so, at about approximately 68 compared to 60 chairs right now. Yeah, a few more seats. A few more seats and then with the re, uh, phase two, we would probably even get a few more. Yes, because they'll the be all. Because if you see now the configuration that we have, there are seats that really aren't even usable for people to sit in and these are very low. Um, so this all stemmed from our, our branding and walking around these buildings and thinking about um, the face of Punta Gorda and how we present ourselves to the public. Then it morphed into technology and uh, Karen and I had extensive conversations about um, offering all city meetings on video, um, which I would think we would all want to move to because the clerk's office is tasked with some, you know, the minutes are very arduous for some of those long meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and this would help it help them out and create even more public access for city business with having all the videos on YouTube, I mean, or whatever we decide to put them on. And uh, 
so then we had a meeting in here and we had all pretty much all of the departments here and that's when we came up with reconfiguring the room because we found out that 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 base that takes up a lot of space down there is concrete and is not easily removed and um, just for like a comfort perspective when you're walking in that door you're walking in to the front of the meeting whereas when the dais is moved back there you're walking into the back of the meeting um, so it would be more of a comfort level and a cleanup and a freshen and the seats would actually be removable so that if we did want to do some kind of meetings in here with tables and chairs which used to happen back in the day when they had the horrible folding chairs <laughs> that did happen in here but once the seats went down and are anchored down mm -hmm. there's no possibility for that so it started with a conversation and also what we want to do in the hallways uh, Donna Peterman and I have worked talked with the History Center and to the Visual Arts Center and have um, different di displays moving in and out maybe two or three times a year um, the first of which would maybe be like a then and now where we could take some of the historical photographs and then we could you know have like a more of an exhibit type area um, because we've collected a lot of stuff and you know it's been here a while so it's, it would be a freshening of especially like our room our I mean the stuff just got moved down there and it, it you know those green chairs probably people pitched them out of their office and so where do they go they go down there and that table is much too large for that room so it would just be you know putting on a fresher face for the public I don't have any problem with um, with phase one. I think this is all things that are necessary, and and, the, and as the building ages, so does the equipment and all of the, the things in the building. So I, I have no problem with that. Um, I do I do have a problem with um, putting a straight dais on the other side of the room. I have an absolute problem with that. I don't know of any council or commissioner chamber that that is a straight dais. We have many opportunities to look at each other and talk face to face when we're in these meetings and I think it's important to have the curve and I, I would be totally opposed to having a straight dance mm -hmm. it could it could be curved mm -hmm. the one consideration to with the podiums I think we went to the straight more straighter look with the podiums because we wanted a main podium in the middle and so then each person would have an opportunity to look straight on to the council instead of being on the side so I think you know that that could be you know mm -hmm. under consideration I would also in reference to that I went to the MPO meeting a couple weeks ago and I was directly behind the podium and I could not hear the people at the podium talking you could not hear one word that was coming out of their mouth mm -hmm. so they have seating right behind the podium yeah, yeah. They, well that's every all the seating is behind the podium oh okay so I thought it, you meant directly a, behind it's a, well I was on the aisle and it's a center aisle that goes up the middle mm -hmm. of the room and the podium is right in front of the first row of seats and I was in the third row and I could not hear the people at the podium mm -hmm. that's in commission chambers oh county commission when you when you uh, are making comments at the county right, right. commission you have to go up front mm -hmm. that's where the podium is that's so that's what Lynn's referencing and um, were they having audio issues no no, no. and that's no. we I can mean, I, I'm, I'm on the MPO board I could hear them fine but there Lynn were, was there sitting were three in or four the, people that were at that meeting that said the same thing to me they said we couldn't hear a word they were saying so hmm. Just I would, and I would just echo the need to have an ability for us. To, in, it, you know, it might be not as curved as this, but mm -hmm. it'll still yeah. need to have an ability to, to have a conversation. And that I would think be if fine. we were all on a line, yeah. Yeah. it would be difficult. That would be fine. Gary? I think we're all on. I think, first of mm -hmm. all, because of the sunshine laws, we have enough time difficulty communicating <coughs> anyway. Right. And we, so, whether it's verbally or really the only I'm sitting here and I'm having a discussion the only person I really can't see right now is Nancy but when I get out of line she can hit me <laughs> so the, the point being is, is I think this is a much more intimate configuration I'm plus as we're talking about it I'm here seeing you know yeah I can see all of our heads going we have a consensus it's much easier to communicate I think in this type of configuration versus a straight one is I think a little bit too formal it doesn't really fit our personalities at least as we exist today and that's what we're deciding on mm -hmm. and uh, yeah if you if you watch any of the news broadcasts and they show any of the council chambers or commission chambers they're all on a curved dais mm -hmm. so just my personal input one thing also I 
the direction I like. Maybe I was in Asia too long, but um, orientation of rooms is very important. People spend a lot of money on it. And I think it's very important that we continue to either face north or east. And I think facing south, I, I mean, just talking crazy, but I think it would be problematic for us as an organization. It's just because these things actually have over a long period of time have impacts based on, on placement. And that's something I'd say it may not be in our best interest of how we relate to each other. Good point. So then you're suggesting maybe that we use that wall instead of that wall. Well, we did talk about moving this down. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, what are we going to do with this big hunk of concrete? Are we going to have to tear we it out? We have to tear it out. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> we would have to tear it out. Well, I don't see the point of spending the time and the money to do that. I mean, we've already got a raised elevated platform here. Why would we do that? Well, it would definitely give us more capacity in the room. And it you know for people to come up and down here it's very difficult so if we i mean if we kept the room as it is we're we're stuck we're stuck with it but in order to increase the capacity and reconfigure you know the podiums are a major problem the way that they are today uh, we still need a raised dais yes mitchell uh, if i may mitchell austin urban design uh, currently, the city is working with a consultant who is doing uh, an ADA transition plan for the city, and that includes all city facilities. Um, I do know that upon speaking with that consultant, they do have some concerns with the way that council chambers is currently configured from an ADA perspective, particularly the dais. So there will be changes recommended in that report. So once we have that report, um, we're expecting that by uh, midsummer, uh, then we'll have a better, uh, clearer indication about what we do, uh, what we could do within the footprint of the existing council chambers to better accommodate uh, those needs. So the, the final design of council chambers will, will, will be informed by that process as well. So we have more information coming. And as a um, talking, uh, talking subject, uh, our fire marshal, Jennifer Molnar, she was um, very concerned right now with the current configuration and the space of clear pathways. And that's the shaded areas because she has to have, she wants 42 inches. That's um, what she is needing. So we need to take consideration whenever we do any type of configuration for this public space that we do maintain um, and keep <laughs> Fire Marshal Jen happy. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, if, if this was not concrete underneath, it would be a much easier fix. But in order to get the capacity and to get, you know, proper podiums and placement, it's, you know, we can move it down that way or we can move it to that other wall. It's, that's open for discussion, Gary. From my perspective, though it's, a, it's and I understand what we're saying, you know, we got a lot of concrete, but I don't have a problem taking the concrete out. I just want to just restate as I'm getting consensus from my, my fellow council members here that we'd like to be able to watch and see each other as we're having our conversations so that a straight podium uh, diocese is not something that we, we would prefer to see. Okay. Okay. I understand this, uh, uh, some of the reasons why it should be east to west, and I agree with that. Per, on a, a general general but it shouldn't be the the catch-all but I think this is the on the priority for me and I suspect for the rest of us is to have this kind of configuration uh, mm -hmm. when we have our meetings mm -hmm. and I think from an IT I don't want to speak for Brad but um, from an IT perspective to convert this into a video room with a window then the person actually doing the recording is watching what's going on in the meeting instead of being totally remote in another room and that would allow a lot more flexibility as far as videotaping and, and eventually I would like to see all the meetings because there's times that you know it goes to the boards or committees even for our sake and you know to go back and read the minutes is not the same as being able to watch the live dis the discussion that took place live Nancy yeah I've had residents actually request want to know if they can watch a video of a particular yeah. meeting and those aren't available so I think that would be nice um, to be able to accommodate um, whatever it is that's going to help us advance and, and keep up with technology and, and be um, more welcoming to the community and, and so that it's not as intimidating for people who want to 
walk into the room because mm -hmm. I know that can be intimidating. So, is is good. I don't know. Are, are, is um, Jaha talking about doing feng shui in this redesign? <laughs> See, we have it's good right now. That's one reason I think council operates well together. There just are changes. It may sound crazy, but mm -hmm. people act differently when so, we're oriented differently. It's I nominate like that Jaha to be the feng shui consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. I mean, it may work well for us, but. For like what Nancy's saying for the public, even when you know I when I'm coming into a different code enforcement or whatever's going on in here, it's it's odd when you just you know you're right there and then we have the noise from the hallway in the mornings. You know when everybody leaves for the presentations, it's like right there in your face. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the orientation should be. But I mean, if it was that curve, we still could probably get our east and stuff that way but <laughs> <laughs> well maybe we need to come up with some for phase two come up with some 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 options where are we at with phase one i think i i'll say i'm in favor of phase one yeah okay. i am too yeah, yeah. good could you take a vote okay and that would include appropriation of the funding please okay, okay so, so we I'll, need a motion to i'll make a motion to approve phase one second and appropriate the funds. And appropriate the funds. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. We will come back with phases two and three in more detail. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, there are a couple of council members who would like to continue using a cabinet, and um, they have you all have access to the mail room with the keys that you have to the building. So we thought that maybe we would provide a cabinet for you in the mail room for easy access. So Perfect. We'll accommodate that. Okay. okay. That's great. <clears throat> okay. Next, we move on to award of amendment number one, phase two, Boca Grand drainage improvements. Hello again, Hi. Miriam Pace, procurement manager. Um, Along with uh, Linda Spazito, Senior Project Manager for the Public Works, she negotiated the scope of work for the second phase of um, Boca Grande dra um, area drainage improvements. And we negotiated an, agree on a, an amendment to the master agreement for design permitting and bidding services. Uh, Kimley Horn holds the master contract for this um, AE for, um, agreement. Uh, total is $231,120, um, and they anticipate the uh, com completion time frame to be 319 uh, calendar days, and staff recommends award of Amendment 1 to Kimley Horn for Phase 2 services. Questions for Marion? No. Nope. No. Motions? I'll move approval. Second. We have a motion a second to approve the amendment award of amendment number one, phase two. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have domesticated versus non domesticated animals in residential Who districts. Wants pot -bellied pig? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, um, interim zoning official. We're just seeking direction. We ha we were directed originally um, to amend necessary portions of Chapter 5-7 for restricting non-domesticated animals and doing some definitions. Uh, zoning and urban design staff discussed with the city attorney, and he feels that we have sufficient safeguards in place. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Yeah, the, the, not exactly how I would have portrayed the discussion. Um, the first thing I wanted to make sure was that uh, as we were talking conceptually about some of the other ordinances in other jurisdictions um, and how difficult it was to make distinctions between animals that might be permissible and those that might not be permissible, I asked the question because I, I didn't recall uh, any detailed discussion previously by this council as to whether or not you even wanted us to go in this direction. I think it may have come up in a discussion having to do with uh, gardens and stuff. So I wanted to make sure we got clear direction from you before we spent the kind of time that would be necessary to draft the ordinance and send it out for public hearings and you know what have you. 
that you want to put provisions in, in the code to differentiate between the types of animals that are permissible or not. And where it came up in the conversation regarding um, the zoning code uh, was with respect to the fact that there are typically two types of general codes. Those that allow for any activity unless specifically prohibited or those that don't allow any activity unless specifically authorized. And we have the kind of code that says that if it's not specifically authorized in, the, in our code, then it's prohibited. Which means, for example, if our, if our general single family residential district um, does not provide for um, the raising of chickens, for example, as a permissible use in the residential district, then according to the way our code is set up, that would be prohibited. So, I mean, I'm not real sure in what context this subject matter even was brought forward, um, but if there is concern about having uh, raising chickens or raising pigs or any other kinds of non-customarily pet type animals, then our code would currently prohibit that and so there's no need for us to go through the exercise of defining what animals are acceptable and what aren't. But So I wanted the council to weigh in on how you would see, if anything, an ordinance on this issue. I think it came up because Terry said that people had called and asked what was allowed and as far as people growing crops in their yards and well, and having a pet pig. Yeah, and a pig and chickens. And chickens and goats. Which everybody I know that's had chickens, they don't last because things come and they eat them. <laughs> Other animals. Yeah, that's real. They, they don't, they don't last. So, uh, I mean, I, I did know somebody who had some and they, and they got eaten. <laughs> Tasted like chicken. Yeah, they got eaten. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know that we've had that many more requests, have we? We've had a couple of phone calls, and they're usually in the neighborhood residential zoning district, not in PGI. Okay, Gary. It seemed to me that part of the discussion was is to differentiate between raising a hog in a garage, which I think was one of the examples that had been brought up, versus having a little uh, Vietnamese pot-bellied pig that weighs 20 pounds that acts more like a dog. Uh, I think that was, as I recall, one of the precipitating parts of the discussion. I think we all agree. I would suspect we all agree because we have a podium that's arched and I can see the hints right, that we don't want to see a, see a hog raised in a garage. Okay, you know. Yeah, but those are cute. The little pot but the little pot of the pigs. They're you know they're they're just a, they're a lap pig. I'm I just, mean, do we really want to move forward with <laughs> leave it alone. arduous right. language? I would leave it alone. I guess you're not hearing anything. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're yeah. <laughs> okay. That unfinished business is now finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> New business. We have the Florida Power and Light Solar Now program presentation. Uh, Mitchell Austin in Urban Design. I uh, just want to inform the council that city staff has been working with uh, Florida Power and Light uh, representatives on uh, this project, so we'll be available for any questions regarding what you find. Good afternoon, now. It's Charlotte Miller, um, FPL External Affairs, and with me today is Kathleen Campanella. She is our one of our Solar Now project developers, and we have been working with county, or excuse me, city staff, as Mitchell mentioned, to uh, propose to you some really interesting solar facilities that would be at no cost whatsoever to the city. And Kathleen has a PowerPoint presentation to go over those details. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, perhaps now. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My name is Kathleen Campanella, and I am a project manager with FPL's Solar Noun program. 
Uh, FPL Solar Now program is a completely voluntary program that we offer to our customers. It gives them the option of contributing $9 per month on top of their normal electric bill to support the development of small-scale solar in their communities. FPL installs, operates, and maintains the projects at no cost to the city. We only ask that the city works with us to identify locations that um, are in highly visible public places. And really, for that reason, because the ultimate goal for us is to bring as much education and awareness around um, these solar energy structures. Punta Gorda actually has an impressive 190 residents currently enrolled in the program. Charlotte County overall has a little bit over 460. So there's uh, certainly a desire within the community to see more small scale solar. Uh, many benefits the Solar Now program offers to the city of Punta Gorda. I think it highlights the city's commitment to environmental stewardship and advocacy for renewable energy, as well as complements other investments in renewable energy and efficiency. Uh, most importantly, I think it offers you the opportunity to recognize Punta Gorda residents currently enrolled in the program as well. We've been working diligently with city staff, Mitchell, thank you, Howard, thank you very much, um, to identify locations that we think would be good fits for some of these Solar Now program offerings. Um, we do that based on the number of current people enrolled in the program, and then we're able to allocate funds that way. So we tried to come up with a really nice mix to maximize how much we could offer. Um, one of the first locations that we looked at was Lashley Park. Beautiful park right near the water, a lot of open space, but not a lot of shading. So you'll see um, we identified a few different um, project offerings that we thought would be a good fit, one of which is our solar tree design. Uh, it may not look like it from the picture, but the lift design is actually 24 feet tall and provides up to 200, and square, 200 square feet of shade. So it actually provides a nice amount of shade. Um, and we tried to place them around benches that are near the water that currently don't have a lot of shade, right? So if you're sitting down and taking a break, looking at the water, um, it sort of serves a dual function. Not only is it um, generating awareness, but it's also serving as a shading structure. And I really like the trees because unlike rooftop solar or universal scale solar, which most people don't have the opportunity to come up close and see, this is something that you see on an everyday basis and you can interact with. Uh, another area that we identified was near the interactive fountain. Um, I had worked with Mitchell uh, and talked with him about uh, perhaps the desire in the future to replace some of these shading uh, canopies that are already there. And we thought, wow, what a great way to use the shading structures and replace it with solar energy. So not only are you providing the shade in these areas, but you're also generating energy. And so a uh, picture there is a rendering um, of what it would look like. And very similar in terms of making sure that it's still shading in the same area. Uh, and I'll also point out the, the structures, I think, are very aesthetically pleasing to look at, probably more so than some of the other structures that you might have seen um, in carports and things like that. Um, the panels are glass on glass. They're weather resistant. And all of our structures meet wind load ratings of 170 miles per hour. This is another uh, shading structure that we're proposing to replace with a um, solar canopy structure. This is the stage area near the water. And then uh, one, uh, another option were these two canopies near the marina. And we thought, wow, you know, when I bring the engineering and construction team out. We're always looking for good roofs, right, to put solar on. And these were two great roofs to put solar on, we thought. Um, so all together, uh, if you look at the three, just go back to this image here. If you look at the three different offerings, the canopy, the trees, and the rooftops, I think it really uh, can serve to make Lashley Park almost like a solar hub, right, and, and really um, sh show the diversification that, uh, that we have to offer in terms of different solar project offerings. So I'll just go back to this. Um, so branding. It's important to us because it is a voluntary program to recognize the customers currently contributing to the program. So most of the branding just focuses on um, highlighting what the program is, that it's the FPL Solar Now program. 
what the product is. In this case, we're looking at a solar tree. And then there's a text back plate. And the text back plate says, text solar tree one to my FPL to learn how you can help plant a solar tree in your community. And it's just meant to be another information source. Uh, we also offer to uh, install a sculpture sign or ground mount sign near any of our installations. <laughs> Uh, the first, the side A um, highlights the program, FPL Solar Now program. It actually won't just say FPL, it'll say FPL Solar Now program. And the side B is uh, open to the city to use for whatever means you see fit. So you can insert a uh, calendar of events, perhaps some information about other green initiatives you have going on the in the city, but it's an opportunity to tell your story as well, which I think is a, is a really cool feature. Uh, Hector House Plaza was another location that we looked at. Because it's relatively smaller compared to Lashley, we thought about using the solar curve design. The curve design is a little bit smaller than the lift. It's 18 feet tall, but it also um, provides 120 square feet of shade. One thing I, we, we didn't um, propose, but we certainly could, is this model happens to come with an additional USB charging port. The lift model, uh, unfortunately, does not have that option just because of the way it's designed, but this model does. So it could serve a dual purpose. Um, it's just incorporated into the design itself, and so if you're sitting at the park and you need somewhere to charge your phone, it gives you the ability to do so. And that's certainly um, no cost to you, an additional add-on if we wanted to do that with these models. And then the other location was Bailey Brothers Park also relatively smaller compared to Lashley Park, so we also looked at the curved design here. Um, we did try to think of placement in places where there was really lacking shade, so to provide some shade there. Um, another additional add-on with the curves and lifts is we can put a standalone bench next to them. So if you're looking for additional seating in one of these parks, we could place a bench underneath it. Uh, so again, just you know, creating more functions for them. A similar branding to the solar lift, uh, just stating what the you know the program is, what what the product is, and then the text back plate to provide more information. And with that, I thank you and ask what your questions. <laughs> Nancy, um, I like the idea. I have a real problem with the trees and the curves. I feel like those should be in a Salvador Dali museum. Um, I feel that's visual blight, and. Um, we have um, a need, I, I agree with Reverend Haddock, we have a need for shade. Um, and if you look on slide seven, where you show the, the example of what is over the, suggested should be over the seating area of the um, interactive fountain, one of those on a smaller scale, much smaller scale, uh, that could provide some, seating, some shade over a bench would be very attractive and, and, and consistent, but um, I have to st stop. I, I can't, um, personally, I find the, the trees and the, to not fit in with the character of our community. Gary? So just to be a couple of things, the, uh, to be clear, so the amount of investment that uh, you're willing to do is really relative to how many people are belonging to the program? Yes, because we utilize those funds to go towards installing. Okay. And, um, so if we were to get more people enrolled, then we would be available to partake in this program even further? Yes, so this is just a first phase, we could call it. Um, okay. You know, these are some uh, initial proposals, mm -hmm. uh, and we can certainly, you know, if enrollment increases, look at down the line doing more. Okay, so uh, I'm, sort of in agreement with Nancy in a little way, but out of the pot. We have some other projects that are going on, this, some really neat projects going on in this city, but they're just not available right now. With what we've got going at Gilcrest mm -hmm. and what we've got going at Ponce, uh, we might want to, to consider investing in some of these as some of the shade things along in concert with the Peace River Wildlife Center, and, mm -hmm. and we're gonna be putting in a new uh, uh, playground for the kids in, in mm -hmm. Gilcrest. And quite frankly, the one, the bigger one, the bigger tree I could see if you would repurpose it with a couple more pieces welded off the side and put some swing sets and have some really neat play toys. <laughs> but, <clears throat> the, but the idea of the, the larger, flatter canopy type I think really fits better personally into the 
personality of what Punta Gorda is about. Uh, and uh, I think that if we look, not this year, but if we look this year and the next couple years up, up I think we have uh, a larger number and more, uh, more better opportunities to utilize this technology, both from our branding standpoint and also from uh, the aesthetics of what we're trying to do in these projects. Just one note to point out, um, because it is a pilot program, we've received approval from the Florida Public Service Commission through the end of this year only to do this okay. program. Um, we're hoping to receive approval, you know, to extend the, the program. Um, but that was some of the urgency working with city staff to identify locations that we could actually work on doing this year. Because we had discussed some of the other parks that had renovations going on. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, to meet the, t the deadlines for this okay. first phase. That's why we well, chose some of these locations. That makes sense. Uh, so aesthetically saying, because we also have, we have micro par uh, pocket parks, are they called? Mm -hmm. Pocket parks, <laughs> where right. actually the curve might fit very well with a bench on a corner lot, you know, that for somebody. Mm -hmm. Is the Tropicana is one of them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to call me, sir. <laughs> there might be some locations where some of the curves of the trees fit. Uh, but in, the, in Lashley, I, I like the canopy, but I'm not sure that we want to just put trees just to have them somewhere. No, and I, and I understand. You know, everybody has a different taste. Some people love the trees. We, we've heard all different things. The Salvador Dali was a first. Yes. Um, that was the first thing I thought of. I saw it, <laughs> yeah. actually. Um, we, did, we did go out. Having watches we, hanging off of it. <laughs> we did, um, you know, think the lifts would be more fitting in that park be, and, and didn't look at structures by the water, per se, because we didn't want to obstruct the views. Um, also, just from a, a, a cost perspective, generally the uh, shading structures are more expensive because they're larger. And again, you know, we were trying to maximize what we could offer and provide as much shading as possible. Um, you know, if you don't think that the lifts are a good fit for Lashley and you wanted to go ahead and with the canopies, um, we could perhaps look at two of the other parks. I know Bailey's Brothers Park was mentioned in Hector House Plaza and see about maybe doing a shading structure in those because they're smaller parks and they wouldn't require as much coverage. Sounds good. Do you have a smaller version of one of these? Yeah, these structures? are actually customizable. Okay. I think that sounds great. That sounds, that sounds really good. Because I provided Charlotte um, a picture of what they have at university, a lot of campuses, University of Florida, I saw it, and it's really cute. It looks more like a picnic table. It's like a, a picnic table, and then there's you know a little canopy thing over the top, and the solar panels are up mm -hmm. there, and the kids are there charging their computers and their phones, yeah, and it's really try. functional. And it fits in well. These are a little, um, and I didn't realize they were that tall. I mean, 24 foot is quite large. I like the idea of the of the charging stations and things like yeah, that. I, yeah, I like that. I like the little picnic table look a lot better than just the tree. Yeah, unfortunately, the tree, that's just the design of the tree, so we can't really change that. Um, it's what we have at the moment. Maybe it'll evolve if the program gets extended. But, um, you know, if you're willing to, you know, if we take the trees out of the picture for the other two parks and for Lashley and we look at the, a shading structure similar to the one that we have here at Lashley, that's certainly an option. It's just um, keep in mind we wouldn't be able to offer the chargers along with that mm -hmm. just to make sure right. that's I would be okay with that. I'm okay with the canopies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm okay with the canopies, and I would be okay with some small structures over a chessboard, like at Hector or something yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. Hector House, you that's know, where it needs you know, to where be. You get some yeah, exactly, where you get some mm -hmm. shade over a, a chessboard or uh, something of that sort. Or as Reverend Haddock I think also suggested at the Bailey Brothers. Brothers. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. uh, if I may, um, Mitchell Austin Urban Design again. Uh, staff can certainly work with Floor Power and Light and, and develop uh, uh, proposals for those other two locations, but if we could work on a, on a staff basis and not need to come back to City Council, then Florida Power and Light can meet their time deadline so we can get the project constructed under the authorization period for this program. That would really help them and us out a lot. Sure. sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, let me frame it then. We have uh, attached the agreement um, that the city attorney has uh, looked over and worked with FPNL on. Um, if, if you're okay with moving forward with this program, let me highlight the exact locations that you would vote on today. Mm -hmm. The uh, shade structure over the stadium seating at the interactive fountain, the yeah. shade structure over the Wally stage, the two uh, solar panels on the pavilions in Lashley Park, 
Mm -hmm. And then getting rid of all the trees, forget the trees, mm -hmm. and doing a, a shade structure over the uh, checkers or chess tables uh, at Hector House Plaza mm -hmm. and over the bench, the bench area, one of the bench areas in mm -hmm. Bailey Brothers Park. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we ended up with. Yeah. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you talked I, about I, the tables. Aren't there tables in Bailey Brothers Park as well? Well, we'd have to pick a spot. Right. Yeah. A spot, yes. either the tables or the bench somewhere. Mm -hmm. We'd mm -hmm. have to pick a spot. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I just have to say, when I um, was thinking about the Veterans uh, Park and asking for shade over the the, um, the area by the gazebo, it's this solar um, shade structure that was re recommended over the uh, interactive fountain seating that reminded me of that. So it was just. But, but we're not including that. In I this. know that. You know, I'm right. just yeah. I'm just saying that that's what it it made me. It just seemed like it was calling to like say put one here, kind of thing. So, I, I, I we would be happy to explore that with city staff. As an well, we haven't funded that park yeah. yet, so that's, that's well, next future. year when it when it happens. <laughs> yeah, but I, we would encourage you to come to us. With, yeah. With okay. That type of proposal. Mitchell, are the structures we have now are they are they reusable in other areas? Uh, the two structures that we have now um, use a sail cloth, um, so they're they're actually they're not rated to uh, they're rated to the point that those uh, those uh, sh sail shades need to be removed when when speeds reach a certain level, um, which is below the the building code threshold for a permanent structure. So, th th given their age, their engineering. Uh, they, they, they would be sent to the recycling. Okay. Okay. Lynn? That was going to be my question. Um, what is the history of the durability of these in a hurricane? Um, they're built to meet wind load ratings of 170 miles per hour. And so was the thing at the top of the hospital when Hurricane Charlie came through, but it blew away. So I just, and gas pumps went away. So mm -hmm. what is the history? Do you have any actual hands on history? Well, a lot of these are these products are the first time we're using them in Florida, you know, within our service territory as part of this project. So I don't know that they've had, you know, there's certainly a number of uh, testing and evaluations that go on in the facilities when they're built. Um, I can't speak to, but I can certainly follow up on whether, um, you know, if, if there's any situational, um, you know, background that I can get for you on that. I'd be interested in knowing that. Yeah, but I can I can certainly get back up though on the testing and evaluation period that the structures go through to make sure that they are fit to meet these these min, meet these wind load ratings. And basically, what Mitchell just said, it's way better than what we have now. So, <laughs> what we have now is right. yeah. But yeah. But I I, am, I do have a concern about mm -hmm. flying objects in in high winds and hurricanes. So. Of course. I will also say, though, if there was ever an issue and there was a storm and something happened to the structure, you know, part of the program is that we are there to service it and make sure that anything is fixed in a, you know, appropriate time frame. So, I don't think that's the issue that Lynn was referring to. We've lived through Charlie. Yeah. It's it's floating debris and, you know, whether it's a two by four or if it's a concrete tile off a wind or if it's a solar panel, that it's really a safety issue that we're concerned about. But, but if God it's forbid, we should have another one. Right. I understand. But if it went right at 170, there was one. I mean, if a hurricane actually hits, I mean, nature's going to do what it's going to do. I mean, exactly. we, we can engineer it the best we can. That's. I mean, we we do keep it that in mind. We know, you know, as a utility company, we understand, right? We we're we're trying to do our best to keep everything as safe as possible. So, but I can get you some background information on that just to make sure that you feel comfortable with it. Okay. Just one. How often do these have to be washed? It's another one I haven't gotten yet, um, but I will find out. Okay, I'd be curious because I've done a lot of work in the large solar generating plants where they have the, the mirrors, the moving mirrors, and they have to be washed on a pretty frequent basis with, uh, with uh, reverse osmosis to maintain their efficiency. Okay, I'll, I'll find out. Can oh, you can? Okay. Well, I can't answer on these, but I can answer on our large scale solar projects such as Babcock Ranch and the others we have. Uh, the panels that are designed now 
uh, are, are really not mirrored type. It's a photovoltaic, and actually, we do not have to um, do much maintenance on them whatsoever. Uh, rains take care of, of the dust and, and dirt. Now, we, we all know we've had a drought, so it could be a situation, you know, if it, if it was a severe situation, we might have to do something, but uh, usually they're pretty self-maintained. But summer's not gonna be much of an issue, obviously. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. That was Charlotte Miller, <laughs> for the record. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, thank you for assisting me in putting together the contract and, and uh, making the changes that I thought were necessary. Uh, the, but during your presentation, you mentioned something about it being a pilot project uh, approved by the PSC. Uh, is there uh, a possibility that th there'll be like a funding um, uh, loss at some point in the future from the PSC? Are you getting stuff uh, from from the state or just they're giving you the opportunity through your rates to pay for this? Uh, what's the connection between the pilot project, the PSC, and uh, your ability to um, fund whatever is necessary in this agreement for the 15-year term? Um, the agreement with the Public Service Commission is to allow us to offer this program to customers. Um, if for some reason the program is stopped at the end of the pilot term, at the end of this year, um, FPL has stated when we petition for the program that we would you know, use our own funds to maintain um, a a any of the structures that we've installed already. Because the, you know, the, the contract is not conditional in any respect to the availability of funds. And so, and, and so I just wanted to make sure that um, we have a clear understanding that even if it, even if the pilot project is terminated, you're still going to have the obligation uh, for the for the term of the agreement. Hundred percent. Okay, thank you. Any other come up? Just a quick question, Reverend Haddock. Again, um, the the purpose of your collection of, of energy. I understand um, you're you're doing this in visible areas. Is it for that particular part, the energy that's collected, or what's? It's because it's um, a program that's funded by customers. Uh, the energy is not supposed to um, benefit any one particular entity, but rather go back to the grid and benefit all customers. So, you know, the long run, the purpose is the more and more installations we do, hopefully overall it'll generally bring down bills for everybody. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so. So we need a motion to approve the uh, agreement with FPNL to do the uh, solar tree, not solar tree, the solar installations at the locations I just mentioned. I make that motion. I second. So we have a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. We'll get Thank started. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have recommendation from city officers. Make it quick. Go. City manager. It. What you got? Nothing. Uh, nothing city further, attorney. Nothing further. Thanks. City clerk. Jeez. Oh. <laughs> it's almost 1 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> Quickly. Uh, vacancies. Two unexpired terms on the Board of Zoning Appeals. One alternate, one regular seat. For the building board, we have one unexpired term for a regular seat and a three-year term for an alternate. And we have one unexpired term on the Punta Gorda Isles Canal Advisory Committee. Under nominations, we have one eligible applicant for a three-year term on the building board. Uh, if you'd like to nominate and appoint, you may nominate do so. Nominate and appoint. Second. We have a motion, second to nominate and appoint Mr. Meyer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried unanimously. Thank you. And then um, lastly, uh, one more thing under nominations. One eligible applicant for the Punta Gorda Housing Authority resident commissioner vacancy. Um, if you'd like to nominate and appoint. Nominate and appoint Carol Brodeur. Uh, second. We have a motion a second to nominate and appoint Ms. Brodeur. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. That's all. Okay, yeah. great. Policy and legislation, I don't really have anything, but I do have another announcement that we're having a Jammers fundraiser <laughs> Saturday at Boland. And um, I've been asked, like, what do the Jammers raise money for? Well, the Jammers are a basketball 
basically police athletic league where the police are the coaches of the teams and they play all summer long and they um, target middle school students, boys and girls that play basketball. And I have the Jazzy Jammers, which is a cheer team that performs at the Jammers basketball games all summer long. And I have 20 Jazzies from ages six to 12. And we outfit all of our kids in custom uniforms the girls get, uh, she's got her shirt down there. That's just their practice gear. They have real uniforms that are funded through this program. So all the funds that are raised are put into the program for uniforms and supplies for the kids. And I think we have about a total of 80 kids this, this summer in the program. So we're um, gonna be at Bowland Saturday. If you don't wanna bowl, come down, cause we have raffle baskets. We have awesome raffle baskets. We have about 20 now. And they range, they're at least $50 value. Some of them are, are up to $200 value. And I'm talking like $200 worth of gift cards for places all over town. So if you don't want to bowl, come down. Um, the bowling is from 1 to 3. So we'll probably pull the raffle around 3, 30, 4 o'clock. So come on down to Bowland and support the jammers. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Nancy? Um, I don't have anything other than uh, I am going to seek another term on the city council. Oh, so nice. I just thought I've already put that out there publicly, but I just thought I would mention it here at the council. So I'm looking forward to hopefully serving another term with all of you. I too have opened up my bank account and started the process of, <laughs> of uh, wanting to re up for uh, hopefully to have the opportunity to serve for an additional two years. I would like to just bring one up, uh, item up for discussion uh, just to make a point. Um, Several couple months ago, uh, Lynn had brought up a point that uh, we might have too many signs sometimes, particularly on Marion Avenue. And um, I think that sometimes we, we, we will band aid things. I just would like to point out that in discussion of the MOD service, there we have uh, uh, to that intersection, we have uh, 18 to 20 different signs, depending on how you want to count them. And that's not counting the markings that are on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the road. Uh, when Howard asked me if I saw them, I had noticed that they had up, been up yet, and that's because I know where I'm going and I don't really need to pay the attention. But for the tourists, there may be a little bit of a, I concerned that there may be a little bit of an overload of information in that particular location. That's all. They weren't as big as I thought they were going to be. Mm -mm. You can't. They're in your face. I didn't think they were that big. Uh -oh. I think you're making, I think they're as big as you, they're supposed to be, except there's so much other stuff around I, them. I imagine them bigger. I guess I didn't. Mark Daring Public Works. There are some changes <laughs> taking place to those signs right now. Um, we're removing the white signs with the black lane arrows, which oh, caused good. some clutter. So there was two of those that are being removed. And you did catch us on the sign size. Charlotte County does not stock the size of sign that we requested, which is five foot by three foot. Those are four foot by three foot. Um, good eyes. Yeah. This is a good, good show. Excuse me. <laughs> I did notice, though, when I did see them, because there's a, a I think a military museum has their sign. I mean, there there Peace are. Peace River Wildlife Center has a they, sign. There are, are a lot. There's just that, a lot of information. And then there's a whole signs. bunch of pedestrian crossing signs too. Yeah, yeah. we've yeah, just we, got too much going on. They're all like boom, boom, boom. And I had the same down the, the, ex, the old brown signs for the Visual Arts Center and um, Fisherman's Village. Are there still there's brown? military heritage sign that's they still. Have there's a Peace River Wildlife sign too. And a Peace yeah. River Wildlife. Yes, those are still up. So Should I'm we look saying, at relocating them somewhere? Relocate them, maybe clean it up a little bit. Okay, take another look today because they should have changed while we're here in this. Even if you today. moved them to the other side of the intersection, it wouldn't be such a, a huge influx of signs all in one spot. Let me ask this here, if you don't mind. What about?